else before we pray. Yes, amen. Remember this, amen. I, w- I want to encourage you just for a moment. We're about to pray. This is something that's unheard of in the time that we live. We, we're going to take a moment as a corporate expression of the body of Christ, and we're going to go before the Lord. That's a precious thing, and it should not be taken lightly. Don't let your mind wander. Get your mind on Jesus. And I want to encourage you. It's not the length of the prayer. It's the heart before God Almighty. God knows right where each one of us sit. And you and I are about to go before the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Do you believe that? Do you believe this morning that this book said there are two or three gathered that he's in the midst? I thank him that he's already here, that he's in the midst, and that he's going to hear us this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. God, we thank you so much. You've been good to us more than we've ever deserved. Father, you've blessed us, God, beyond anything we could ever comprehend. Lord, you saved us from the fires of hell. And for that, this morning, God, we're eternally grateful to you, Father. And we bow our unworthy heads in your presence here, God. We're only made worthy by the blood of Jesus, by that precious blood that was shed on Mount Calvary. God, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And God, it's our prayer. It's our heart this morning that Jesus Christ be lifted up. God, it's our heart and it's our our prayer this morning. And it's in our heart, God, and it's in our minds, God, that Jesus Christ be lifted up because the word of God says that if he's lifted up, that he'd draw all men to him. Father, we're asking you, Lord, in this time that we live, that you'll touch these prayer requests. I pray for each one of them individually and collectively, God. I pray you'll touch every need, God. I pray you'll touch it according to your grace and according to your mercy, that you'll minister to every need. I pray especially this morning for the backslidden, for the ones that are lost, the ones that are not in, Father, the ones that are wayward. We pray for the family members. God, we ask you, God, that you do whatever means necessary to bring them into the fold before it's too late, God, that they may escape the fires and the damnation of hell. Father, we're asking you this morning that you do a work in our hearts. I pray that we truly grow in the grace and knowledge of God. I'd ask you, Father, this morning that the Holy Ghost, that he would have preeminence, that he would do whatever he wished to do in our hearts, that you'd touch us. I pray, God, that your word, Father, be first and foremost in everything here in this church. I pray, God, that you'll reserve yourself a place that'll preach the undefiled word of the living God. I pray, God, that you'd put a shield of protection around this church, God, around this fellowship of believers. And I pray, God, that you'll bless them with the truth always of your word. Give us a hunger. Give us a holy hunger for truth. Give us a holy hunger for your word, God. Give us a holy hunger for Jesus, Lord. And Lord, we'll be extremely careful this morning to give you all the praise and to give you all the glory, for it's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. That's all right. No, man. That's okay. Amen. Amen. We appreciate the church family. That's what she's telling you this morning. For those that couldn't hear, since you've been here 20 years, that she can feel the love of God in this place, that she appreciate the church family and said that she's here because the church loved her, reached out, and we've helped her, you know, and just, she just, she's just part of the family like we would anybody, just loved her. Amen. And that's what she's telling. She wants you guys to know. And so I want to tell you that I appreciate what we have here in this church. I appreciate this church family. I think uh, I seen Thomas post something one time, said small church, but big family. And I like that. That's what we are. We're small church, but a big family. Amen. We want to minister the word of God this morning. If you would, my goodness, if you'll turn to the book of Colossians, I'm going to, I'm going to read a few other things here as we get started. But I want you to turn to the book of Colossians in chapter 3. And now you just wait on me. I'll be there in a few minutes. Amen. I want to preach this morning. Uh, I, 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 this, I got under deep conviction about this last night. 
And uh, I want you to know this morning that I, I honestly, in my heart of hearts, I feel that I've heard from God. I feel that I've heard from, I feel that God's talked to my soul here this morning. Amen. As you're turning there, I want to give you my title, what I just simply named this. I named this Barren Land, Where is the Revival? I said, barren land, where is the revival? Now, let me, de de uh, let me define what I'm calling barren. Uh, barren is something that's unable to produce. Now, whenever Zion gets in travail, that is the church. Whenever she's in travail, she will reproduce. And I want you to understand something of the times and the seasons that you and I are living in. If you take a worldly church and you put that in Islam, it's going to produce a worldly church in Islam. A church will always reproduce after its own kind. That's why you're seeing the foolishness go on in the churches uh, today. And they're not preaching the word of God. They'll never probe your heart. They'll never deal with sin. They'll never tell you about hell, which is mostly in this book right here. They'll never tell you about what Jesus said. They'll never tell you about what the word of God said not to do. And they'll certainly never take this word of God and let it uh, convict your heart or take this word of God and let it diagnose you and tell you just where you are with Jesus. You can take the word of God and the word of God tells us that if you're born again, you're a true believer in Jesus, you will produce fruit. Amen. Amen and amen. Faith without works is dead. And this word of God will tell you just where you are with Jesus by simply inspecting the fruit of your life. And some of you here this morning, you need to get saved. I said, some of you here this morning, you need to get saved, amen. If that offends you, I'm sorry, be offended. But if you don't get saved, you will die and you'll go to hell and you'll spend an eternity in a hell, amen. If you truly are born again by the Spirit of God, there will be a fruit in that life. And I will not, under no circumstances, give you uh, the opportunity to put your finger in my face on judgment day and say, Marvin, you bought in with the filthy lucre of the world and you never told me. I've come by to tell you that you must be born again by the Spirit of God. And if you're not, you're of all men most miserable. You're lost and you're without hope and you're without God. Amen. The only hope that you've got is to be born by the Spirit of God. Amen. I watched my wife have three children and I promise you when we left that hospital, there was no mistaking that she had a child. I don't believe it's any different in the spirit world. I don't believe that God can save a man, that he can be radically transformed and the man never know it. Amen. I believe that if you've truly been touched by the power of the Holy Ghost, I believe that if you've truly been touched by this great salvation of this God. Amen. I believe with all of my heart there'll be an evidence and you'll know that something has happened. So I've come by to tell you that you must be born again. And that's one of the areas I feel that we've aired in this modern day church that we've seen that's emerging all around us. And right now we're reaping the harvest of fields that were planted 20 years ago. I said right now we're reaping a harvest of flesh that was sown in the pulpits and throughout the sanctuaries many years ago and it never got dealt with and it was nothing but a reproduction of nothing but unregurgitated flesh amen that God never would accept and they sat in the house of God raised their hands spoke in tongues run in circles and done everything but they went home and lived like junkyard dogs and there was no real fruit of Jesus living on the inside of them there was no love there was no real faith it was nothing but a production it was nothing but a show and right now my friends if you look all around you we are reaping a harvest of the seed that were sown in yesteryears. Amen. I want to ask you a question. Amen. If you're saved and you know Jesus, have you ever asked yourself the question, why is the land barren and where is the revival in the house of God? Have you ever asked yourself, where is the conviction? Why will God not work in the time that we live? Have you ever, sir, got down and asked yourself, why will God not work in my family? Baby, it's my iniquities. Amen. And my sins that have separated between me and God and seized his hand to work in my family. Maybe it's me that needs to get right with God and repent, amen, and do what God's asked me to do. Maybe, amen, it might be me. Have you ever thought, amen, that you may be the problem? And that's one of the things that, that's the probe that's never been dropped in the modern day church. I want to admonish you again this morning, and we've used this as a powerful illustration, and I want to use it again this morning. If that doctor walked in and said, brother, I want to tell you something, you've got cancer, and 
and he had some cold cream and said, we're going to put cold cream on the cancer and have a good day and think positive thoughts. Everything is going to be all right. I'll tell you what they ought to do with that doctor. They ought to pull his license and put him out of business because he's no doctor at all. That's what they ought to do with most of the preachers around here in this county. They ought to pull their license and put them out of business because they're no men of God at all because they'll never, amen, probe that heart. They'll never deal with the sin in those lives, amen. They'll let everybody go right on to their own destruction for the sake of not offending nobody because they don't want to lose votes and that's what makes them a politician in the pulpit. I've come by to tell you they're hirelings, amen. They care not for the sheep and they're just hirelings. They can be bought, amen, and they don't care that people are literally sitting in the house of God and have been for years and they're singing amazing grace and they're falling into the fires of hell throughout an eternity and nobody seems to care. I want to ask you this morning, where is the conviction in the house of God? How is it that a man or a woman can come to God's house and their home be a wreck and torn up and thinking about getting in the bed with somebody else's spouse and sit there and not even conviction even touch their soul and can live, amen, not be faithful to God and it never touch the heart and their heart never get pricked, it never get dealt with. I'm asking some trill questions here this morning. I'm talking about a barren land that is producing no fruit. Where is the revival? I can promise you one thing, amen, I'm no meteorologist, but if you let the conditions get right, I promise you it'll rain. I don't understand how that works, how the dew comes up, the humidity, all these things, but every time if you just get the conditions right, I promise you it'll rain, amen. Most of us this morning, we realize there's something missing in the house of God. There's no conviction, amen. There's no mourning over sin. My God, you can't even get people to pray in the time that we live. Folks is lost. Their children is lost, amen. Their homes are a wreck, but nobody will cry out to God, amen. You know why? Because something inside of them says they don't even believe that God's going to fix it. Or maybe they like the muck or the mire that they're in. I've come by to tell you, amen, that the grace of God will pull you out of the muck. It'll pull you out of the mire. I've come by to tell you, amen, that this grace of Jesus Christ is one of the most beautiful things that you've ever seen. But we are not to take the grace of God and take it back to the hog pen, amen. The grace of God was good and sufficient to come by to drag me up and get me out of the hog pen, amen, that I would go on. Not that I'd go back to it. We're taking the things of God and the holy things of God and throwing them before dogs like casting pearls before swine and we're taking the things of our flesh and things that we want, the things that we desire that are unregenerated flesh has already wanted and we've tried to anoint it. We've tried to drag it before God and God would never anoint it. I can tell you what God said about the flesh. It ought to die to be crucified. There's no hope for the flesh, amen. It's to be crucified and that life Amen. There has to be an exchange there for this flesh and the old me for this new man. Where is the conviction in the house of God? And mine, I say, where is revival in today's time? Does it bother you, dear friend? Does it bother you, saint of God? If you're a saved, born again, believer, child of God, that heaven is your home and you're just passing through, you're a stranger and a pilgrim, then you'll have to look around at the condition of the modern day church and ask yourself, my God, where is revival? We've watched this thing. You know, years ago, we used to call it the Hank Tour. Brother Hank was a blessing to the church. He still is. It's a blessing whenever God raises up an evangelist, well studied like him, that can go in and help a church and revive it. A revival, amen, is not just for the lost to see them saved. I'll tell you what a revival is for. is to get the church, the born again believers of God, amen, to get them back on God's timeline, to get them back on God's heartbeat, amen, so that they can do the work of an evangelist, so that evangelism can come out of that, that the church be revived. Where is the time whenever it's revived? How long has it been since you've got up in the morning and said, my God, honey, it's Sunday. I'm ready to go to the house of God to see what God's going to do. Oh, there's a revival going on about three miles over. It's on the other side of town. I want to go and be there. I just want to be in the presence of God, amen. Whether they're Baptists, whether they're Pentecostals, I don't care. Maybe Jesus will be there. If I just pray in the name of Jesus, I want to be in the presence, amen, with people I'm going to spend an eternity with, amen. Where is revival in our own home? 
home, where is even the understanding that maybe we need a revival? We've seen that downplayed through the years. Many people have stood up and said they don't need revival. I've come by to tell you things is bad. Amen. We've watched this pandemic hit the church world and shake this thing like never before and it told us something. It taught me a lesson. It showed me that we didn't have near what we thought we did because most of them stayed home. Many of them never did go back to their pulpits. Many of them right now are still only preaching on a Sunday morning. I've come by to tell you, amen, that there's something shut up in my bones. Uh, there's a fire. There's something that's real to me. I understand that I'm a pilgrim and I'm only passing through this land. This world is only temporarily and when this thing is over in a few days, all I'm going to have left is what I've done for Jesus, amen. All I'm going to have left is what I have committed unto him and he'll keep that against that day, praise God. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you noticed that the land is barren? Have you noticed that there is no birth of the Spirit of God? Does it bother any preacher that might accidentally be watching this on the internet? Does it bother you, amen, that sinners are driving by our churches left and right day by day by day and they're not convicted and that people, unregenerated people can come in and sit in the house of God and never be confronted and never be convicted and leave just exactly the way that they walked in? You see, until that ever bothers that pulpit, it's never going to change until it ever bothers your soul, until you look around in your family and say, you know what, it's about time I get busy living or get busy dying. I can sit here and go to hell with the rest of them or I can get them to do something about this. You're the only person that can do anything about it in your life. But first you've got to realize there's a problem. And if you don't realize there's a problem, I want to encourage you this morning and bless your tender heart, but get your head out of the sand because you're acting like an ostrich. They tell me that an ostrich, whenever it's offended or scared, that it sticks its head in the sand and thinks that it's all right. And that's been the norm for the time that we live in. Everybody's head's in the sand and we don't want to talk about the hard issues that, are, that we're facing today. And I don't know whether you know it or not what that school system is trying to put into our children down there and how they're trying to change everything. I'm going to tell you something. You better get the Bible in them and daddy better get on his face and he'd better pray and daddy had to better start being the change in that home that he wants to see because I'm going to tell you something, hell is not hell's working overtime, I mean hell's been in a revival scene like for year after year after year after year and for the most part we've sat and done absolutely nothing about it, you know I took issue I, I've only been preaching this gospel solid I mean solid preaching, never turned back for about 15 years and I've looked and I've wondered about them elders that sat in these churches and watched them go south and watched the things come in that should have never come in. They knew something was wrong. Something was telling them that something is wrong. Something is coming in. But for the most part, uh, they sat there and done absolutely nothing about it. If you're watching this broadcast, amen, and your church is in a mess, I want to tell you what you need to do. You need to get, amen, the core of that church, the ones that will pray and seek God's face and find yourselves an altar, amen, and commit yourselves to prayer and go tell Jesus on that pastor and go tell Jesus on what's going on. Don't sit there, amen, and get comfortable in that mess, amen. Man, do something about it. Get on your face and seek God till he comes and rain righteous down upon you. I take issue this morning. I think that we've all had a part to play in this as we become cool, calm, and collective while everything changed and the normal thing went out the window. Amen. And now the things that used to, we wouldn't even entertain in our mind. It become nothing but modern day norm, normality in everyday life. I remember through the 80s if we heard a cuss word on the television, my Lord, we cut it down and cut the thing off and we were lost. People dying and going to hell, amen. But we knew that it wasn't right to hear stuff like that. But now you can't even turn on the news, amen, for the sake of your children hearing something that they shouldn't hear. And now it's become normal. And it's the same thing in our house. It's the same thing in God's house. Uh, it's become a normal thing, amen, for a man to be shacked up and living in adultery, to come in and sit down in the house of God and never be affected by this gospel truth. Where is revival? Do we understand this morning that the Word of God says that unless the Spirit of God draw you, you cannot come into this thing. You cannot wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I believe today will be a good day to get saved. I believe I'll just repeat a prayer and everything will be all right, my friend. I wish that it worked that way, but that's totally against the grain of God's Word. For the Word of God said that no man comes except the Spirit of God draw him. We've forgotten how precious it is for the Holy Ghost of God to draw. We've forgotten how precious it is for the Holy Ghost of God to wake you up in the middle of the night 
God. Oh yes, I still get a hold of that every once in a while. That precious Holy Ghost will come by and wake me up in the middle of the night and give me a dream that will frighten me, amen, and cause me to fall on my face and say, God, have mercy on me. I repent and I get up and walk a little bit different, amen. Yes, it's a good thing whenever the Holy Ghost of God deals with us, but how long has it been since we've even preached on that much less walk, much less even look for it, or much less expected God to deal with our hearts? Where is the revival in this barren land? A barren is a land that's unable to produce. If the church was born out of life, the life of Christ, surely she would produce life. We have mistaken baptizing people into the church for born again salvations in the time that we live. We'll bring people in as long as they'll confess to us. But I've read this book over many times in the New Testament about people that's confessing about Jesus, but the Bible says they're going to hell. I said people that are confessing Jesus Christ and they're going to wind up in the fires of eternity. They do not possess the fruits. Many of us right here today, many men sitting here right now, we've missed it by a thousand miles. We've watched our homes turn into a wreck. And little by little by little, we've never done anything about it. We've never said, my Lord and my God, I've got to get this home to a prayer meeting. I've got to get my heart before Jesus. And I'm not talking about just being present in a prayer meeting. I've got to get my heart present in that prayer meeting. I must get a hold of Jesus. Amen. I can tell you one thing, amen, whenever the situation gets dire, that seems to be the only time that you and I want to do anything about it. It seems we live in a time that the only time people want to pay their cell phone bills anymore is when they've cut the thing off and they can't make that phone call or get on Facebook. A lot of them do the same thing. That power bill never gets paid every month. Same thing, they're procrastinators. They're nothing but lazy people. They'll wait till that power bill, that truck shows up and they've cut the thing off and that's the only time they'll pay it, amen. And that's what's happened in the time that we live. The situation has to get dire, but as long is everything is going in the norms. You know, you watched it, amen. You look at your workforce out here. You can't even drive through McDonald's anymore and get a gravy biscuit. They had to quit making the thing. You can't even hardly get anything in a reasonable amount of time because they've got nobody working, amen. And yet it seems that everybody's looking for a job, but nobody's working. Every place is vacant. They're shutting down because they can't get any help. Do you realize what's happening? That stuff has got into the church, amen. I said that stuff has got into the church, amen. Where is the faithfulness in the house of God? How can a man say that I love him? I told you the story and it never touched me like anything in all of my life. I watched Dan Lee. My uncle stood over there at that casket. Some of you hadn't heard this. I watched him. I, I, I knew them all of my life. And he stayed faithful to that woman. And there was never a doubt in my mind that he ever loved that woman. I remembered uh, one day he was telling, uh, I went over and he wanted me to help him write a song. And he, he tried to write it. And he, I don't know if he ever got it or not. But he was sitting on the couch and he saw his wife out there just picking up a flower or something. And he was overcome with emotion. Just wanted to write a song about how much he loved her. I remembered. I never forgot that. Amen. He, he understood what love was. And I watched him stand by that casket there, friends. I watched him stand by that casket of that loved one for 50 five years he's married to her and he said for the last year or so she was sick bedridden he was confined to the house and had to stay right with her and went with her as far as he could go and was standing by the casket and when I saw that everything in me made this statement from deep within my heart it said there's nothing in that man's life that says he loved that woman by looking at his life and knowing that he stayed faithful to her even unto death there'll nothing in your life ever say that you love Jesus no more than you being faithful to him. I said, there's nothing in your life that'll ever say I love him than me being faithful to him. Friends, it's going to be over in a few days. Mike, he's fixing to be 70 years old. I promise you, he'd tell you it's went by like that, hadn't it, Mike? It's been like this. It's been, it's been over. In a few days, your whole life is a vapor. You watch that vapor come up on the stove. You turn your head and it's gone. Your life is going to be over. And all of the couldas and shouldas and wished I would have is going to be over. There's going to be no time for nothing. There's going to come a moment when you're going to close your eyes and you're going to die. And wherever that tree falls, there it's going to lie. We had better get a hold of something right here this morning. And understand that it is time for God to work. And I promise you that it's not God, amen, that's backed his hand up, amen, it's us. I said, it's us. If we just get the conditions right, it will rain. I said, if we just get the conditions right and meet God's conditions, it will rain. Amen. 
the house of God sits this morning and all over the land full of people that's disobedient to God. One of the worst things you could ever find in Scripture, God is more hard. He said obedience is better than what? Sacrifice. If you went and sold everything you had and give it to the poor and live poor and naked the rest of your life, that wouldn't be near as good in the eyes of God as doing what God told you to do. They'll nothing say that you love Him no more than being obedient and faithful to Him. You cannot separate faithfulness from obedience from God. Amen. I said you cannot separate the two. They're one and the same. You'll never be obedient if you're not faithful. You'll never be faithful if you're not obedient. Amen. A good faithful person, they'll always be obedient to their master. And I'm not, I'm no king in this. Thing. I have a king. I've got letters from the king and I'm here preaching about it and I'm just doing it. I'm a man under orders and I'm doing what God told me to do and I'm going to meet him in a few days. Amen. Give an account of everything he told me to do and I'm just trying to do everything that I can to be faithful and ask God, what are you asking me to do? Lord, where would you have me to go? What would you have me to do? And that's the best that I know in my simple minded heart. That's the best that I can do to love him. Amen. Is just do what he's asking me to do and be obedient to the cause. And to try to wake us up here this morning and to tell us that we need revival. In Psalms 85 and verse 6, it says, Wilt thou not revive us again? Have you ever thought about that? My little girl loves that song about the revive us again, O Lord. Have you ever asked yourself, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? I want to shout, amen. I want to run the aisles and praise God. But my Lord, I don't want to shout over a bunch of sin. I don't want to shout over a bunch of fakes and a bunch of phonies. I want the real deal, amen. I said, I want the real deal, amen. I said, I want the real deal. Let me tell you what an old man of God said that I called on to this. Oh, I called on to this. I've been a skeptic most of my life. And I've got really good reasons because I've seen a whole lot of foolishness. I've seen people profess a whole lot of stuff that they didn't live. And amen, there was no fruit of it in that family. And everybody you go and talk to in that family would tell you they're a fake and they're a fraud. And there's nothing to them because they don't live that at home. Little boy sitting in the car one night and a man got up and preached the message about living one way and living another at home. And a little boy sitting on that back, pu- back seat in that car spoke up and said, Papa said, that preacher said he's talking about you tonight, wouldn't he? You think about what we're talking about this morning. I've been a skeptic most of my life because I've seen the stuff. I've seen the way they lived. And I thought, my God, I said, if that's the Holy Ghost, if I said the Holy Ghost will let you go and look and act like that and go home and treat your wife like that, my God, I I need something to change my heart. I need something to change my direction. I can't do it myself. I'm messed up and I need help. I need the grace of God, amen. And the grace of God will pull you out of the hog pen. And set your feet on a rock. John Kilpatrick said this. He was the pastor of the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida, whenever it hit. In 96 or so of the Father's Day outpouring, it lasted for about six years. And it was a revival of convictions. That's the ones that God's dealt with me about in my heart. And it was a revival of God's conviction. And he said something. He said, for two years we held out. He said, for two years I held off. He said, I've I, I seen people get up and want to put their shows on, this, that, and other. But he said, we held out. And he made this statement that touched my heart and changed everything for me. He said, if you ever settle for something that's not God, you'll doubt everything you ever see from then on. If you ever settle for something that's really not the Lord, you'll doubt everything you'll ever see from then on. How true of a statement that was. I said, God, we need revival. I've often wondered through the years I've been preaching, I've, I've combed through this book and I've tried to find messages and, and fancy titles and just everything that I could think of to bring revival because God knows we need it. Amen. I've come to the realization of this thing that the only way revival is going to come is when God sends it. And if God's not sending it, we better ask the question why. The things is bare and they seem to be going south even in the church. The numbers are depleting. Now pastors are wanting to resign. They're wanting to quit. People don't show up and you can't get nobody to work. You've got one or two people that's carrying the whole load. Amen. And I understand why some of them are wanting to quit. And you're asking God, my Lord, what's happened? Amen. There's no conviction in the house of God. You preach your guts out and you study your brains out and there seems to be no movement. There's no change. And you want to ask the question, my God, what is going on? There's got to be a problem. I've got one question. Joe Biden is your president. Did you just get mad about that or did you ask God why? It changes things, don't it? Because I don't like it no more than any, any other saved 
anybody that's truly saved under the blood of Jesus. I don't like it either. But we got mad because we didn't get the one we wanted. And we never stopped and asked the question and really dealt with it. God, why? If, I don't know where they stole it. If they did steal the thing, then have we ever asked the question, God, why? Because ain't nothing gets by the Lord, God. All this is happening. You know it, God. Why, why, why did this happen? Why is your hand pulling off of us, God? Is it us? I can tell you, if you want to know the condition of that nation, you take a good look at that church because that nation will always be a reflection of that church. That nation will always be a reflection of that pulpit. And you watch since the 80s. I watched them old men of God back in the 70s and 80s. I love going back and listening to their message. They saw what, what we're in today. They saw it coming back in the 80s. And they saw it coming in in small portions back then. One lady, I'll give you an example of one I heard yesterday. And I've heard this message several times. This was back in the 80s. He was seemingly as a God man. And he made the comment. He said that they were in a meeting somewhere and a lady was talking. She said, yep. She said, I had two or three cocktails and said the Holy Ghost said, two's enough. He said, my God. He said, would the real Holy Ghost stand up? He said, would the real Holy Ghost please stand up? Because the real Holy Ghost wouldn't have let you have the first one. Amen. I'm looking for the real. Not the one that just gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling because a lot of them with warm, fuzzy feelings are going to die and go to hell at the end of this thing. I'm looking for something that will change my life. I'm looking for something, Corey, to make me go home and love that woman like God told me to in the Word of God. I'm looking for something to change me, cause me to go home and love my children and raise them in the fear and admonition of what God said. I'm looking for something that will give me fruit, amen, bushel, baskets of fruit hanging off of me, praise God, because the Word of God said that that's the only way your Father's glorified in your life is that you bring forth much fruit. Are you barren this morning? What kind of fruit are you producing? Because the limbs and the bushes and everything that don't produce fruit God said at the end of this thing, he'll cut them down and put them into the fire. That's not popular preaching. You know why, amen? I can tell you the only person in the world that's got trouble with preaching on lying is a liar. Amen, Brother Marvin. Amen. That's the only one that's going to have any trouble with that. The only person that's going to have any trouble with preaching on faithfulness is one that will not be faithful to Jesus. You take a field full of dogs down yonder and sling a rock in them, the only one that's going to holler is the one that it hits every time. But the trouble anymore is that whenever it hits us, our lip comes out. And we can't see that it's an almighty God that loves us. And he's trying to poke and prod and get us to look up. God wants to change the conditions in your environment so he can bring revival. So he can save your children. So that your children come into this thing and get saved. You know what happens when daddy gets right with God and falls in love with Jesus? Nine times out of ten, mama gets right with God and falls in love with Jesus. And nine times out of ten again, the children get saved and they fall in love with Jesus. And their children get saved and they fall in love with Jesus. Go read your statistics, amen. It means something for a man to get right with God, amen, and put Jesus first and not be barren no more. But the trouble this morning is we've watched multitudes sit in the house of God. As you held in your place there, I'm going to read you something right here that I believe has done more damage in the house of God than anything. God gave specific instructions about the anointing. I said God gave specific instructions about the anointing. In Exodus chapter Number 30, in verse 31, it reads this. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Now watch this very carefully in verse 32. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. God never meant for the holy anointing of all to ever touch a man's flesh, amen. Now we've watched more and more people, they've glorified the flesh and they've got in the flesh and bitterness and hatred and everything, all the works of the flesh. They talked about in the women's Bible study the other day. Now we've glorified that, but the word of God said that upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy and it shall be holy unto you. And then he says this, whosoever compoundeth anything like unto it or whosoever putteth any of it on a stranger shall even be cut off from his people. Whenever you take the flesh 
and try to bring it into the anointing of God and replace it, it'll never work. Because the word of God specifically states in Corinthians, says that no flesh shall glory in his presence. In Colossians, before I get to Colossians, let me read you this. I just turned there. Isaiah, the 59th chapter says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. Don't it seem like that God's hand may be a shortened in some way? Doesn't it seem like that God's not doing anything? God's not convicted? God's not drawing? I promise you, amen, you've never seen a meeting until somebody got up with a conviction of sin and their knuckles were white from gripping onto the pew, amen, and they knew that they had transgressed the laws of a holy God and they knew that the fires of hell was going to be their home and they knew that by the power of the Holy Ghost the preacher didn't have to hold them over hell amen they knew that because the Holy Ghost of God convicted their souls and finally they got up and said yes to Jesus and ran to that altar and got gloriously saved but whenever that took place they went home and everything in that house changed and there's faithful amen to Jesus there's faithful to the cause amen and everything changed my friend you talk about a revival how long has it been since we've seen a day like that in the house of God Food for thought, ain't it? Does that not make you think something might be wrong? Let that soak in for just a moment. Could it be possible that something is wrong? Could it be possible that maybe I've honored him with my lips, but my heart is far from him if he's not working and he's not present? You see, it takes a foolish man to know that something's wrong in his body and never go get checked out about it. To see if it's not cancer. Because if he doesn't get the cancer, the cancer gets him. We've put cold cream on cancer for years. And now the body is dying to death because of it. We never dealt with the cancer. We never dealt with the paralysis. We, went, we walked in the house of God time and time again. We knew something was wrong. We knew something wasn't right. We knew something wasn't there. I've been to funerals of my own family and preached them back years ago when they still had funerals. You realize right now when you go to a funeral, even the family don't show up anymore. People have gotten lazy and complacent. Used to that, I used to say, that was my saying, I said, it's a shame somebody's got to die for us to get to see each other again, but now they won't even show up for a funeral. But I went back in the day when they did show up and I watched them sit there on them pews when I preached this word of God. I talk about the love of God in your heart shed abroad by the Holy Ghost. I talk about getting saved over there, amen. And I watch grown women sit on the front rows of those funerals and cry and weep knowing that something was wrong in the heart. Something was wrong. But I want to tell you one of the most foolish things in the world, amen. I want to tell you what's got us in the shape that we're in is whenever that prophet, amen, that prophet, the Holy Ghost I'm talking about, when he did come by in that prophetic utterance and he took that heart and touched it, amen, and we knew something was wrong, we got up and brushed that thing off and went out the door and rejected it. That's why the land is barren today, because we've rejected it time and time again. It doesn't mean to us. It's a show for the most part. Isaiah, the 59th chapter says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. God says, My hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is my ear heavy that it cannot hear. But God's not hearing. God's not moving. But he says this in verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, and your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue has muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. There is not one person in here that would put up with two seconds. If I was in a bar last night getting drunk, nobody in here would put up with me coming here and preaching this gospel this morning. If you knew I was cheating on my wife in the bar last night, this Bible speaks, high, speaks harshly against adultery. But I'm going to tell you what it speaks a whole lot more of is lying. It's a whole lot worse on a liar. And the woods is full of them. I said the woods is full of them. We'll tell lies right in the face of God. And we wonder why there is no revival. No conviction. We've been desensitized to everything that book has told us to get away from and stay away from it. And we wonder why there is no revival. We wonder why that home is messed up. When we've defied God to his face and said no. And we think we're going to get away with it. Used to in the Old Testament you died without mercy under that law. 
Whenever that man with good intentions reached and grabbed that ark, he had good intentions to stabilize that thing. God killed him. You know why he killed him? Because he said, they ain't no unclean thing going to touch this holy thing. That's what he said. And that's what happens whenever we get into that realm. And we think we've got escaped this thing because of this dispensation of grace. But I beg to differ, sir. Oh, we're paying a price for it. We're paying a price in our families, our homes, our children. And it's going to catch us at the end of the road. And you're standing there. The father over that home, you stand in their own judgment and perhaps you do make it and get in by the grace of God. When the word of God said there'll be no liars in heaven, the word of God said all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. When you're standing there at the end of this thing watching your children be thrown into a devil's hell and your reality hits you, I could have done something about that. That's the reality nobody wants to preach anymore. That is the reality that's not in the modern day church. That's the reason that they're doing everything. That's the reason they've got plexiglass up and got girls and boys on each side of it licking off whipped cream for a lesson in the back now. Ain't that sickening? That's what's going on. Nobody ever got outraged over it. Nobody got outraged over it. I said nobody got outraged over it, which told us we're just as guilty. I said we're just as guilty. I wouldn't expect nobody in here to put up with me getting out of line with this word 10 minutes. I'd expect you guys to convene a council here and vote me out and get me out of here. I'd expect that. Amen. And God expects it too, that we hold the line in God's business, that we don't compromise, that we take God's word seriously, that we look around today. I've said something in counseling so many times. I've watched many times I've had somebody come and talk to me and said, my spouse is leaving. I've had to deal with that time and time again. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that 90% of the time I was just talking to another guy that comes here on Sunday night and his sister was divorcing and he was talking to the husband. And the husband said this. He said, brother said she left me a long time ago. She just now finally done it. But said she'd been gone in her heart a long time. That's what will happen in God's business. I've wondered how many people right now, some of you know some of the people I could call names. You know people that used to be anointed of God could sing like nobody's business. I mean, I'm not even anointed. I'm just here because we don't have anybody. But I'm talking about people that could sing that was anointed, could bring tears to the eyes. You could feel the conviction of God when they strum their guitar and they get up and preach the word of God, give messages out in tongues. And now you look at them now and they're back in the bars. And they went right back to the slums. They went right back to the hog pens. And I've often asked myself time and time again, I wonder how many years, how many years did they stand on that platform and lie to me as I sat there? I wonder how many years ago it was when they left Jesus. They just finally done it. You see, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single footstep. It has to begin somewhere. And many of us started that journey a long time ago, and we've never corrected it. Many of us, that we know something wasn't right. We know something wasn't right in the heart. We know we didn't have our business together. We know that everything was messed up, amen, but we never took the time to pry. We never took the time to balance that checkbook because we know it was broke. That's a foolish business man. They'll never put that calculator to that checkbook. A foolish man to keep writing them checks. But eventually, one of them's going to bounce. And they're going to send it back. Eventually, it's going to get us in trouble. I want to ask you something this morning. I'm not even in the vicinity of being done, but Kayla's coming to the piano. I'm going to ask you this morning, all sincerity, do you understand how dire the situation is this morning? Do you understand? It's not an open show of screaming and hollering and jerking these altars down and crying. And it, I'm going to tell you what it's a matter of. It's a matter of leaving here today and walking different. It's a matter of leaving here today and knowing that something is wrong. There's a cancer that's got in. And my God, I don't know if we have to leave here. I don't know where we would go. Do you? I said, I don't know where we'd go. I feel like we've come down to the end of it. I feel like that Jesus may come any moment. And I feel like that hell has come in and run roughshod over so much. Complacency has got in. And I feel like we've done very little about it. That's just the truth. Because when Zion gets in travail, she will birth. 
You get hungry saints of God around an altar begging for God to save somebody's child. I can promise you. Fear struck me the other day because I've been down this road. Fear struck me when Miss Barbara said, my son's coming in. Said he might have to come the hard way. And fear struck my heart because here's what I know. I know that God will not shun the prayers of a righteous person. I know that God hears them and God loves that righteous person. I sat in my office in uh, 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 Lynchburg, Tennessee. I had a guy call me and he said, I got a guy working for me and said, he's messed up. Man said, can you help him? And I was left Telahoma and I said, I don't know if I can. I said, have you meet me at the church at 12. I was coming from Telahoma. It was a 12 mile drive. I just closed my eyes, didn't pray nothing fancy. Said, God, I need help. Would you please give me something? Did you get, I need, I don't know what to do. I'm going inside, I don't know nothing about. Met the guy and his woman at the office there and I sat there behind the desk and I listened to him tell me all of his troubles. Wasn't nothing, nothing mattered, didn't nothing mean nothing. I didn't know nothing about anything. And finally I heard God. God say right here, said, who's praying for him? I meditated on that a minute while he kept talking. Finally, I interrupted him. I said, who's praying? I said, God said, who's praying for you? And he stopped. And everything changed. I said, who's praying for you? And tears run down his eyes. He said, it's my grandma. I said, son, I said, your trouble ain't with the devil. I said, your trouble's with the Lord. I said, you've got a grandma that's at home praying for you. And I said, God's raining on your parade. I said, God sent you by here to a man that don't know nothing about it to tell you that that's him. And you can't fight against God. You can come the easy way, you can come the hard way. But something's going to happen and it's going to get worse and worse and worse whenever them saints get in travail. And they get in travail over them lost souls. And they get in travail. Over them. Where are the grandmothers, amen, that used to lay up, amen, in the wee hours of the night and pray? Now everybody's on a pity party and it's all about them. But where are those old sainted grandmothers? They've gone on to glory. But where are the replacements? Where are anybody that'll pick up the torch? Who's going to fill their shoes that'll crawl out of that bed, amen, and cry out to God over a lost soul in the the family to see God touch it, amen, and reel them in. Because God's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. If the church will get in travail, it will birth. That man of that house, if he'll get in travail over that family, it'll come under subjection to the will of God. If he'll get his heart right with God. That don't mean doing everything just exactly right. You can forget that. But you know what I mean? Humble yourself before God Almighty. And He'll fix a whole lot of stuff that was wrong. He'll bring it under subjection. But the most foolish thing about all of this is to hear this kind of preaching and never do nothing about it. That's what's going to be bad on the day of judgment. You'd have been better off if you'd have never known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turn from it to what God says. How long has it been since we've just seen good old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction where somebody fell under conviction and said, I don't care what I look like. I don't care what nobody thinks. I got to tell, tell Brother Corey I'm sorry. I got to tell Brother Matt I'm sorry. Brother Mike, I got to tell Mike I'm sorry. I want things to be right. Where, where is it we, we get under conviction and we, we realize we've transgressed God? Not about how we looked. I mean real conviction. One that'll work repentance. Sorrow of the world works death. Oh my Lord help me. I'm not even nowhere close to being done. Have you ever thought about being the change that you want to see? Have you ever just looked at your life this morning as your eyes, everybody close your eyes just a moment. Get your mind on Jesus for just a moment. Have you ever just looked and it's none of nobody else's business. It's between you and the Lord this morning. But have you ever just looked at your life and said, you know, something's got to change. Something's got to get different. There's no peace. There's no joy. Have you ever just wondered, God, why? I want to invite you for just the next few moments. Let him talk to your heart. If you're seeking truth, you'll find it. Because He is truth. I said, if you're seeking to be right, you'll never find truth. But if you'll look for truth, you'll find it. Would you allow God to put His finger on something in your life this morning? And show it to you. 
And you go home and repent of that thing and deal with it. You must be born again by the Spirit of God. If you're not born again by the Spirit of God, you will die and go to hell when this thing is over. I can't do nothing about that. Do you know Jesus? Are you born again of the Spirit of God? Do you have the fruit of a born again believer in your life? Father, in the name of Jesus, I've did the best I know to do, God. I'm, I'm, I'm like my Uncle Danley. I've, I've come to the gravesite, God. I've gone as far as I can go. And I don't know what else to do. But God, I know what you dealt with me about. Oh my God. Lord, I know, God, how you shook this old boy's heart. I know, God, what you've dealt with me on, Lord. I've tried to communicate that here this morning, God. But God, I'm asking you, Lord, to touch our hearts. I'm asking you, God, to help us not to put cold cream on cancer no more. I'm asking you, Father, that we once and for all realize, God, that there's a problem all around us. We realize, God, that it's invading left and right. That we realize this morning that it become a reality in our hearts that we're going to meet you in a few days. And it's a holy God that we're going to stand before. And the only hope that we've got is that precious blood of Jesus. God, make it real to us, I pray, God. Oh, God, forgive me, Lord, if I never come across the right way. But, God, you've seen the heart here this morning. Father, we need you, Lord. God, we need revival. Lord, our children are lost. God, we've everybody here, Lord, we've got people in our family that are lost. And, God, we can't reach them, Lord. That wasn't true of that early church. That wasn't true in the book of Acts, God. I see where you moved with, com with conviction, God, and compassion for the lost. But God, we've not even seen anything that comes anywhere close to that, God. God, help us this morning. Have mercy on us. Let us understand, God, that no man comes up the Holy Ghost draw him. God, that means you, the Holy Ghost, are going to have to have something to do with it. And if he's not moving, you said that no flesh will glory in your presence. Then maybe, just maybe, that flesh has stood up and the Holy Ghost is gone. Father, we ask in this morning, make these truths a reality in our heart. And we can once and for all change. God, I pray you'd be with us men. Because most of us men sitting here, including me, we've been cowards. God, I said we've been cowards. We've never allowed you to deal with our heart. We've never got our homes in order like you told us to in your word. We let things go and we've let things go and we've cried about it, but Lord, we've never done nothing about it. God, have mercy on us this morning, God. I'm asking you, Father, that that precious blood would touch us. I'm asking you, God, that you'll have mercy on us. Lord, I read this last night where Nehemiah, I read when he realized them walls was broken down, God, he realized there's a problem and the gates was burned with fire. God, he repented before you for his people and the transgressions of his people, God. God, this morning, Lord, we repent. We ask you, God, to forgive us of our transgressions. Forgive us of our complacency. Forgive us of the things we've let in our house. Forgive us of the things we've let into the church. Forgive us of the things we've let into us and we've never done anything about it. And we wonder why we're fighting such a hard battle now. And we're reaping a crop, we're reaping a harvest of the seeds that we sown in years before. God, that's us. It's us, Lord. Help us, Jesus to realize this and understand it, God, that my God, we can do something about it. The devil just as soon have us sit here and think it's all somebody else's fault because when we realize it's us, we could turn to you and get forgiveness and bring it under the blood of Jesus and stand up as free men and go forth in true change and true righteousness and true holiness. And bring our homes under subjection to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, help us to know that there's no other place to be. There's no other, nothing no greater than for our homes to be obedient to Jesus. How grand that's going to be to walk in the streets of glory on that day. To know that we loved Him and was faithful unto death. God, 
with all of my heart and all of my soul. God, I feel like for 15 years I've been beating at the air. I've wondered and I've marveled, God, and I've wanted to know where the conviction is, where the birth is, where the new birth is, God. My God, Lord, we don't even preach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but Lord, we can't even get people saved, much less get them filled with the Holy Ghost. God, would you help us, Lord? God, we're in a mess. We're in a mess, and we've done little about it than anybody in the world. Father, would you please help us, Lord? We're asking you this morning, God, for your help, for your guidance, that you'll lead us out of our own bondage. Open our eyes. We pray for wisdom. We ask you, God, you let us see, Lord. And Lord, I personally want to thank you for dealing with my heart and shaking me, Lord, over this. It's made me realize there's things inside of me, God, that's got to change. Now, God, don't let us talk about it. Help us this morning, God, not to just be a hearer of the word, not a doer, because the word says we deceive ourselves in doing so. Help us be a doer of the word. You said faith without works is dead, God. You said that our light ought to shine, that this world would see our good works and glorify our Father what's in heaven. Father, I pray, God, that you bring revival. Help us, oh God, to get our hearts right before you. I'm asking you, God, that you'll help us get the conditions right, God, to meet the conditions of that holy word, God, for a true Holy Ghost-filled revival. I'm not interested in no more moves of the flesh, God. I've seen so much of that, I'm sick because it's profited us nothing. It's what's got us where we are today. So God, here we are looking at you. Here we are this morning, Father. There's so many precious saints of God that's sitting here this morning. Many of them didn't leave their church. Their church left them. They realize how dire the situation is. Help us, oh God, to do something about it. And we pray, God, that stuff never come in here. We ask you that you keep a shield of protection around it. Help us to persevere. Give us the strength, the courage, the guidance, and the wisdom. Get our hearts before you in spirit and in truth.